Good Tuesday afternoon to you, 4 o'clock time for Sports for CLE. Hope you're having a great afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we heard on Deshaun Watson's latest podcast, QB Unplugged, uh, rehab's going pretty well. He's kind of advanced um, to the performance aspect of it. throwing a football. Um, what we're waiting to see is exactly what Kevin Stefanski and the Browns offense has in store for kind of showcasing Deshaun's talents this season. Um, Dan Orlovsky talked about that on ESPN's NFL Live. Deshaun Watson and the Browns are the biggest unknown. Mm. We just don't know exactly who Deshaun is as a player right now. He hasn't played in more than six games in a season since 2020. <sighs> becoming Since becoming a, a Cleveland Brown, he's got 14 touchdown passes. And I just don't know, like under Kevin Stefanski, what offense they're going to run, actually, because he came over yeah. from Minnesota. It was this heavy play action offense. Then last year with Deshaun early on in the season, when they did go 5-1, and one, mm. it really wasn't a heavy play action offense. And then Deshaun gets hurt, and Joe Flacco comes in, and it goes back to a heavy play action offense. And I don't know if Deshaun is overly comfortable with running the offense the way that Stefanski has traditionally run it. And just that's why is Deshaun remotely close to the player he was, and then what kind of offense are they going to run after this full offseason now that he's hopefully as healthy as possible. With that, let's welcome in Mary Kay Kebett, Browns beat reporter for the Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com. Um, Mary Kay, I, I know you've talked uh, to Kevin and Andrew Barry and even the Haslams. Why do you think the Browns are confident um, that Watson will be ready to start the season um, despite, you know, the, the questions with his shoulder injury? Well, they've worked extensively with Deshaun's surgeon to make sure they're all on the same page, to get progress reports along the way. Uh, they've collaborated on his program of rehab. And then their head trainer, Joe Sheehan, went out and supervised those initial throwing sessions at UCLA last week, or actually the week before last. And everybody feels good about it. And I think that even though there's not a precedent for this injury that I can find, at least in modern times, they believe that because it, it was a broken bone and that a bone can heal so well, and maybe in some cases even be, str be stronger than it was before, they're very, very confident that they will have the uh, three-time Pro Bowl version of Deshaun Watson back under center. You, you know, the, the other thing is um, – the offense, nobody knows for sure what it's going to be like, um, but it sure seems like with the changes to the offensive staff, the additions to the wide receiving core, even, you know, Naheem Hines, it seems like, does it seem to you like um, they're trying to do everything they can to surround Deshaun Watson with everything to make him as successful as he can be, to, to maximize his skill set? Yes, and I think it's been that way since the day he showed up. I think they've worked very, very hard to supply him with as much talent as possible. That's why you saw them go out and get Amari Cooper, one of the best in the NFL. That's why you've seen them draft some of the players that they have and sign some of the players that they have. Jerry Judy, Elijah Moore. Uh, so they've done everything that they can to surround Deshaun with as many weapons as possible. And I think they feel pretty good about their situation heading into 2024. Um, what about the offense? Ke you know, Kevin Stefanski won games with four different, very different quarterbacks um, a season ago. Um, you bring in Dorsey and, and you bring in Tommy Rees and Andy Dickerson. And it, Kevin Stefanski just doesn't seem like a guy that's going to say, this is my offense and this is the way it's going to be. Um, am I reading that correctly, or, or do you think it's a little different than that? No, that's exactly right. He is always open to growth. He has a growth mindset in terms of learning and growing and changing. And he has brought in a number of guys that he's very excited about, some of whom come from the college ranks. So the college game and some of these concepts are sort of trickling up into the NFL and now you've got fresh ideas coming in from some of these guys like you said the Tommy Reese the Nick Charlton's who's going to be the run game coordinator and some of these other coaches that have come in it's really an overhaul of the entire offensive coaching staff Ken Dorsey as OC as we know and it's going to be a new energy a new vibe 
And I think it's going to be exciting. I think these guys are going to be very creative. I think they're going to be very explosive. I think it's going to be innovative. And I'm anxious to see how it all comes together. I know you've answered this in your Hey Mary case. I'm curious. What do you think um, of the Browns running back room? You know, they add Foreman, they add Hines. Um, when you look at the running back room now, what do you, what do you see? Well, what I see is some different sizes, shapes, and speed levels. And that's what they need while they're waiting for Nick Chubb to come back. I don't think Nick Chubb is going to be ready by the beginning of the season. I think everyone's expectations need to be managed a little bit in that regard. Anybody who has a fantasy team or anybody who has a Nick Chubb jersey needs to kind of temper the enthusiasm a little bit and realize that he's probably not going to be bounding out there in week one and rushing for 100 yards. He's going to need some time. He only had the ACL surgery in November in a regular person that has never had two completely blown out knees it takes nine months to come back from an acl surgery so he needs a little grace he needs a little bit of time and people just need to be patient about when he'll be back in the meantime i think they have a good running back by committee you've got speed with jerome ford you've got a little bit of speed and some great power running with pierre and with dante foreman Naheem Hines, you've got some different things, although he's more so a returner. So I think what they have exactly what they need to get the job done. Um, what about the latest news uh, on um, Nick Chubb and his contract? And again, I know this is from one of your Hey Mary Kays. Well, they don't have to do the contract right away. So even though the contract will be redone at some point, and he does have that $15.85 million cap charge for 2024. They kind of have to wait a little bit and see what he's going to be able to do this year. And then when you have a better idea of that, then you can craft a contract that is a win-win for both the team and the player. But as of right now, they don't really know what he's going to be able to do right away. And as Andrew Beery told us at the NFL meetings, over the next three months, they'll have a much better idea. Now, this month in April, he's going to start load running. And that means he will be doing some cutting, some agility work that he has not done to this point. Once he gets into that a little bit more, then everybody will have a better idea of what he will be capable of. All right. Um, some news today as well. Brown signing former Jets special teamer and Cleveland native. Uh, went to Glenville High School. Justin Hardy, 2022 Pro Bowler, um, has appeared in 100 uh, career games with the Saints from 2017 to 2020. Jets uh, last couple of years, one career interception. 63 special teams tackle. So a cornerback who excels on special teams. Fair to uh, fair read of, of Hardy? Yes, he's a gunner. And the gunner has become even more important with the new kickoff rule changes and all the things that that's going to bring. There were not very many kickoffs last year. So your special teamers are going to be even more important this year than they have been in recent years. And he's excellent at what he does. Uh, as you mentioned, he was a pro bowler in 2022. People might remember that he recovered the onside kick in Joe Flacco's unbelievable, improbable comeback over the Cleveland Browns, the 31-30 victory in week two of 2022, where he threw two touchdown passes in the final 82 seconds of the game. And of course, that would not have been possible if Justin Hardy had not recovered the onside kick. So great, big, huge play by him. He comes in here with just ready to go uh, to town for his hometown team, and he's really excited to be here. Mary Kay Cabot, Browns beat reporter for the Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com, and I are going to step aside, uh, take a quick time out. Uh, other side of the break, talk a little bit about Kevin Stefanski and Andrew Berry's upcoming uh, contract extensions, a matter of probably when, not if. Sports for CLE, be right back. Stay with us. Maximum Millions and $2 million ultimate cash from the Ohio Lottery. And you may never look at scratch-offs the same way again.
We continue talking Browns with Mary Kay Cabot, Browns beat reporter for The Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com. Mary Kay, I, I know you wrote an article, uh, again, from the owners' meeting, Andrew Berry talking about um, how he feels about the forthcoming extensions for both him and Kevin Stefanski. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's exciting. Jimmy and Dee Haslam, when we talked to them at the owners' meetings, they did acknowledge that they are close to these extensions. I've been writing that this was going to happen this offseason and that it really was just a matter of when, not if. But to hear Jimmy say, we're close, I thought that was great. And so then we got an opportunity to ask Andrew about it. And, of course, he's not going to talk specifically about the contracts themselves and how it's going and how long they're going to be and all that kind of stuff. But he did talk about the fact that he and Kevin work really well together. He can't wait to see what Kevin has in store over the next 10 years or so. And uh, it's, it's kind of exciting for Browns fans and for the organization that there is continuity, that they're not blowing it up after every year or after every two years like they had in the past. So it's good for everyone. You can build on what you did the year before, and you can kind of see how maybe this thing could end up uh, in what they all really want, which is a Super Bowl. Yeah, and and again, um, keep in mind, you know, when Kevin Svansky and Andrew Berry were brought in, that's coming off the 1-31 in and in, in that nonsense. Um, they've been over 500. they have had a couple of 11-win seasons. Um, and, and I'm sure now they view it as the job is perennial playoff team and, and go and win some playoff games. That's the next step in the evolution of the franchise. Yes, and everyone was so disappointed about the way last season ended after getting there with Joe Flacco and the feelings were all so positive and the energy was so good and I think everyone expected that they were going to win that game and advance into the playoffs and that was just a huge I think shocker for everyone uh, but when you really look at it they overcame so many injuries and it was probably a lot to ask to think that they could go on the road and uh, you know and beat a team that's that good with kind of one hand tied behind their back with so many of their guys out so We'll see how it goes this year. They've, they've added some pieces. They haven't gone crazy in free agency, but they've added some role players. They've, for the most part, run it back on defense. They really believe in that defense. They've overhauled the offensive staff, so they've made the necessary changes to try to get to the next level. Now let's see what they've got. So this is from NBCSports.com, uh, Patrick Doherty, head coaching rankings. Um, they got Andrew Reid, number one, Sean McVay, number two, John Harbaugh, number three, Kyle Shanahan, number four, those, and Mike Tomlin, number five. Those, hard to argue with that. Number nine, they have Zach Taylor of the Bengals, and number 10, Kevin Stefanski. Last year, um, they ranked Kevin Stefanski 16th. Uh, Coach Stefanski has proved he's no one-hit wonder. We hope he also proves something to himself, that if he can open up his offense to suit Joe Flacco's slinging style, the same can be done for Watson. Uh, Mary Cat, you know what? That's, that's fair. Uh, Kevin Stefanski has won two Coach of the Year awards, and he should be in, in the top third of the NFL coaches. Um, relative to, I don't know that he has to open it up, Build an offense around Deshaun Watson, and, and I'm, I'm excited to see that. I, you, if you don't believe he has one of the better offensive minds in football, you probably haven't been paying attention. <laughs> well, you're right. I mean, to be able to do what he did last year with four different quarterbacks to get them to the playoffs, that was pretty remarkable. And when you look at it, he really hasn't had an opportunity to run the kind of offense that Deshaun Watson feels comfortable with yet over an extended period of time. It was supposed to happen last offseason, but Deshaun Watson got hurt very, very early on and everything changed from there. He overcame it in that Baltimore game and somehow was able to, to go out and strap the team on his back and win that game in such dramatic fashion. But for the most part, Kevin Stefanski was dealing with that strained rotator cuff where uh, Deshaun was really struggling to come back from that and there was no continuity there. And he, they just didn't have an opportunity to really work together in the way that they hopefully for them will this season. So I, for one, am very anxious to see how Kevin Stefanski can handle a Deshaun Watson, what he does with him, what, uh, you know, what he can bring out in him, how he, how he can maximize his skills and abilities. And uh, those two together, 
that's going to be the X factor here. If those guys can be a, like a mini version, I'm not comparing them, but a mini version of an Andy Reid and a Patrick Mahomes, who knows what can happen. So um, I know you also wrote an article about this. Browns are going to be cautious with Dorian Thompson Robinson, and, and they're, I guess they were surprised they could get Tyler Huntley. Take us through that and, and what you found out in that article. Well, when it comes to Dorian Thompson Robinson, as I mentioned, everyone seems to forget because he's flown under the radar that he suffered a somewhat significant hip injury on December 24th in Houston when he went into that game to relieve Joe Flacco. And I just remember seeing him in the week after that. He was on a crutch. He was walking through the locker room. I talked to him for a second, really by myself, and I asked him about it, and he just said, my hip is messed up. I mean, and he sounded down about it he seemed kind of dejected about it it had just recently happened and he was still sort of in the shock of it all and it just didn't sound good at the time and when we asked andrew barry about it at the meetings on tuesday he said of course we're going to be cautious with all of our players coming off injury and that didn't sound to me like hey he's going out there in the offseason program and he's going to be 100 percent, and he's absolutely fine and he's ready to roll i did not get necessarily that vibe from it so i think they you know they're going to play it a little bit slow with him and i think they were very surprised to get tyler huntley because i i came to find out when i was at the meetings that he had a chance i believe to go to pittsburgh uh that was the way that it was presented to me but then when justin fields signed there that kind of went by the wayside he became available he ends up here and the browns are happy to have him not just in his own right but because there might be a little bit of uh, time in the offseason program where they have to rely on him and James Winston a little more than they can Deshaun and Dorian Thompson Robinson. Certainly explains why they got Huntley in addition to Jameis Winston as well, um, with Dorian Thompson Robinson being banged up and them not wanting to rush him. That's part of it, but when you look back to last offseason, they also had four quarterbacks last offseason. So I think there's a world in which they would have done it anyway, but it still certainly helps uh, knowing that they've got two quarterbacks coming off of season-ending injuries. So I know you've talked about this. Um, Cade York, why the Browns bring him back? This is from one of your insider um, pieces as well. Well, we did have an opportunity to talk to Andrew Barry about that. And we know how Andrew Barry loves his draft picks. They don't go out and draft guys unless they've done their due diligence, they've done their homework, they've done their background work on these guys. And when they bring a guy in, when you only have six swings at the plate, you're really gonna do everything that you can to bring in a guy that you think can make it, even though the chances after the third round of making it and becoming a bona fide starter or contributor are very difficult, uh, but that's what they do. They believe that they can do it. And when you spend a draft pick on a kicker, you really want him to succeed. So I think that they believe he's got plenty of talent. They always believed that. And I think they see him as sort of a Daniel Carlson type who started out with uh, the Minnesota Vikings and Kevin Stefanski was there through that. That didn't work out. They ended up cutting him. He goes on to have just a, a magnificent career. And I think they look at Cade in that way where he's got plenty of upside potential and they believe that he can realize that potential. Maybe it will be here, maybe it will be somewhere else, but they always have a developmental kicker around through camp, through the off season. Why not Cade? So also from your insider um, notes, uh, Greg Newsom trade rumors. Is there anything to them? I don't think so. We asked Andrew point blank about that at the meetings, and he just said, you know, I can't control where that kind of stuff comes from, but we expect him to be here with us. And, uh, you know, he spoke very highly of, of Greg Newsom. And also, I do believe that they will be picking up that fifth year option, which has to be done by May 2nd. Once again, it's a high draft pick, a first round draft pick of Andrew Barry's. He does not take that lightly by any stretch of the imagination. And they give these guys time to develop. They give them the benefit bit of the doubt in some cases. And in terms of cornerback, you can never have too many good cornerbacks. So I don't think they're going to give up on one very easily. Let's stay on the defensive side of the ball. It, I think by my count, nine of the 11 starters back for Jim Schwartz's system uh, in year two. Do you see an improvement? Can you expect the defense to be, you know, the top defense in the NFL again? 
Well, I do think it's a great question, and I also addressed that in um, as the lead question of my Hey MKs on Sunday, uh, because I really thought that it was a very, very interesting question. Can they be the number one defense again? And they did for all intents and purposes, for the most part, run it back. And I thought, and I've said this many times, I thought that they should have added another impact, big name defender. One who could go out and get you double digit sacks and force fumbles and get interceptions and make impact plays in 2024. But they didn't see it they, that way. They feel like they've got some guys coming back. They were excited to re-sign Z. They've got some guys like Oboe coming off of injuries. And they didn't go out and break the bank on a Christian Wilkins or someone like that. Uh, so we'll have to see how that works out. But my feeling on it is that when you have this lineup of quarterbacks coming in, especially to Cleveland Browns Stadium, but just all across the board in 2024, that maybe you did need to make a little bit bigger of a splash I think they'll have a good defense again. Not 100% certain that they will be at the top of the mountain in 2024. Mary Kay Cabot, Browns beat reporter for the Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com. And I'm going to step aside, take one more time out. Other side of the break, we'll talk a a little bit about Jerry Judy, Jerome Ford, uh, sports for CLE. We'll be right back talking Browns with Mary Kay Cabot. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin. We continue talking Browns on Sports for CLE with Mary Kay Cabot, Browns beat reporter for Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com. Um, Mary Kay, I know you, you've addressed this in your Hey Mary case. Do you think Jerry Judy can get his first 1,000 yard season with the Browns? I think he can, but it's going to be a matter of opportunity. When you look at the Cleveland Browns, he's not the number one receiver here, and he might not even be the number two option here because, of course, you've got Amari Cooper and you've got David Njoku, and those guys are going to get their targets. Now, maybe he will. Maybe he will be right up there with them in terms of getting the ball. First, he has to develop a nice chemistry with Deshaun Watson. That's got to happen. Those guys are going to have to get together in the offseason season as much as they can and work together uh, off to the side and, and try to develop that chemistry. But I do think that he has the potential to do it. We know that because two seasons ago he had 978 yards or something like that in Denver. So he's certainly capable of it. It's a matter of opportunity for him. And will there be enough footballs to go around for that to happen? What about Jerome Ford? Uh, again, I, I know one of your viewers, one of, one of the uh, readers asked you, do you think the Browns will move on from Jerome Ford? I don't think so. I don't see that happening at all. I think they really like Jerome. I think they like his speed. He's another player that almost had a thousand yards last season and I think he's certainly capable of that and I think that's another reason why they went out and hired Deuce Staley as the running backs coach I think they feel uh, that that will be a boost for Jerome Ford and then they've got him surrounded with some other guys of course Nick Chubb's going to be coming back at some point and that will shake everything up but when he's still working on his knee and coming back I think that Jerome Ford can hold down the fort do better than he did last year. In addition to everything else I mentioned, he will have his tackles back. He'll have his starting offensive tackles back, and I think that will make a difference in the run blocking and those kinds of things. And then you've got some of the other guys, such as Foreman, such as Strong, such as Hines, and I think they'll be able to get the job done. So um, everybody has asked this question. What do you think about the Joe Joe Flacco Why do you think the Browns didn't uh, make him an offer? Well, I don't think it made sense to make him an offer after they had pivoted to to Jameis Winston. Once you pivot to Jameis Winston and you know 
that he's younger, that he's available. I think they originally thought that he was going back to New Orleans. So you don't think about him. You kind of take him off the plate a little bit. But once they realized that he was going to be available, that he was interested, that Deshaun Watson would have been excited about him coming here, uh, then there's no reason to make an offer when you are that far down the road with the guy that you think that you're going to sign. So even though heading into the negotiating period, the weekend before that, they still thought that there was a very good chance they were going to bring Joe Flacco back. And I think Joe thought he was coming back. I think that's why he did those public appearances that he had here. I think he thought he was still going to be a Cleveland Brown. Um, but once they got far enough down the road with Jameis, I think it didn't make sense at that point to all of a sudden say, yeah, well, you wait a minute over here. We have to go talk to Joe again. No, they knew what they were going to do, and they just moved forward with their plan. Um, a guy that's kind of forgotten on the defensive side, linebacker Jacob Phillips. And I know um, one of your readers with the Hey Mary Kays asked you about it. What have you heard about Jacob Phillips? Well, Jacob is he's healthy. He's working out. He's uh, recovering nicely from – uh, from the torn peck, and and he's working really hard, but he's a free agent, and he was permitted to, to go into free agency without the Browns making him an offer. And if he hangs out there long enough, there's probably a chance that they could revisit it. But right now, I think the Browns expect that he's got some opportunities. I know they wish him well. They hope that he finds something. If he doesn't, maybe he can come back here on the vet minimum a little bit and see, you know, see what happens. But as of right now, it's not a front burner topic. Um, let's talk about the draft a little bit. Do you, do you think Andrew Barry has something up his sleeve exciting, or, or is it pretty much going to be a, a boring draft day for Browns fans, um, waiting until the second pick? And, and I think it's five picks total that they have currently. Yes. Um, I don't know exactly how it's going to go on draft day. I don't think they're heading into it planning to trade for a big-name player or trade away a big name player. I think right now they're very focused in on number 54, number 85, seeing what they can get in those first their first two rounds of the draft, round two and round three. Maybe they look for some trade opportunities. I'm sure they're working the phones over the next couple of weeks, seeing who might want to move around a little bit when they get to number 54. And uh, they'll be ready for anything. But the thing that we know for sure about Andrew Barry is that he does not draft for need. So don't be looking over the roster to try to figure out where they have some holes to fill. That's not how they'll do it. It doesn't matter. You can have an abundance of players, and they will upgrade at that position if they find someone that they think is better. And it's the way that you have to do it. If you go around drafting mediocre players to fill holes, you're going to have a mediocre roster. You've got to get the absolute best football players that you can find and let it flow from there. All right, before I let you go, when you look at the roster, um, are there areas you would still try to upgrade? Uh, and just an overall view of it, you know, before the draft, um, it's probably just tweaks left. I think it probably is just tweaks left, but I'm going to stick to my story that I think that they still need another surefire double digit sacker. And if you can find that player somewhere, then by all means, try to get him some way, somehow. I don't think it's in the cards. I think they're happy with what they have and maybe things will shake out a little differently than they did last year. You've got Obo coming back healthy from a torn torn peck of his own. Uh, you've got Quentin Jefferson now in the middle. He had six sacks last year. So I think they believe that they will get their, their sacks and their pressure and their production that way. But if it were up to me, I'd still be looking for that guy. Mary Kay Cabot, Browns Beat Reporter, Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com as always. Thanks so much for the time and the insight. Appreciate it very much, Mary Kay. Sure. Thanks for having me. Mary Kay Cabot, make sure you check her out. Always outstanding Browns coverage. Cleveland.com on the internet, the pages of the Plain Dealer as well. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. We continue talking Browns. Casey Kinneman, straight ahead. Sports for CLE. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin.
Play Maximum Millions and $2 million ultimate cash from the Ohio Lottery. And you may never look at scratch-offs the same way again. I am powerful beyond my wildest imagination. I will define my future. I will keep challenging myself to improve. Because I am a future leader of this great nation. I will be responsible for raising a beautiful family. And educating not only my generation, but many more to come. I will make a difference in my community. And I will stand up for what I believe in. I will not settle for simply chasing my dreams. I will achieve them. Because I was given a chance. An opportunity. A home. At Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America. The ultimate leadership experience. FCCLA has been one of the greatest experiences of my life. It's made me who I am today. Join us. We'll build a new future together. We continue talking Browns on Sports for CLE. Mina Kimes uh, from ESPN's NFL Live on uh, Deshaun Watson and what this Browns offense will look like with him as the quarterback. I feel like we're kind of asking the same question we asked before nice. last season, which is, is this a good marriage of play caller and quarterback? Mm. And does this quarterback make sense with this personnel? Because it's tricky because last year we saw, as you alluded to this, with Joe Flacco, Really kind of proof of concept for yep. the offense. Mm. Very heavy play action. Not just play action, very heavy under center play action. And in doing so, um, top 10 in QBR with Flacco. When they ran play action with Watson, which as you said was less often, uh, near the bottom of the NFL in QBR and you know less likely to be under center. Still some under Ooh. center, but it raises questions of like, okay, if we saw this offense work so well this way, does the quarterback have to meet us there? And I think it's an urgent question because, and we're going to get to this with Field, this roster is mm. stacked. Like, going through on both sides of the football, sure. uh, there's a reason why they made it to the playoffs last year. And so I think this question about what is the best offense for this quarterback and this quarterback, can they, he adapt to the offense, it's more urgent than it would be for other teams. Mm. With that, let's welcome in Casey Kinnaman, Dog Pound Daily, the Barking Browns podcast. Um, Casey, I, I think you kind of got to twist that a little bit. I think the reason you brought in all the different offensive coaches are because you're going to change the system to meet the quarterback. A am I missing something there? No, no, not I like Mina. She does really good. Oh work, yeah, but I agree. Facing anything on what happened last year, to, this this offense was deconstructed and rebuilt to fit Deshaun Watson. That's the only reason all this was done. If it was going to stay the status quo, you'd probably see a different quarterback as the backup. You would, you definitely wouldn't have got another offensive coordinator to come in. You would have kept all the same voices, but they didn't do that. And this isn't this isn't the era of you have to fit our system. When you got a playmaker like Watson, they're going to do everything they can to build the offense around him to fit his skill set. So while I agree with some of her points, the, the, the reality of it is that we, we don't even know what this offense is going to look like based on all the new voices they brought in. We're going to find that out over time. And we can think we know during training camp by a couple clips or even during some looks in the preseason, but the reality is – Come week three, week four, we're really going to start to understand what all this offense is. Well, and if you think about it, um, it might have been in the works last year, but y you had basically a freak monsoon in week one against the Bengals. You lost Nick Chubb in week two against the Steelers. And then it was like, hold on. Yeah, yeah, it was adapt and overcome at that point. And, uh, you know, Stefanski was able to fall back into what he's comfortable with after so long when all the pieces started to get, or you started missing pieces, injuries, all these different things happen. They were able to do that. But now I think they've kind of burned the ships so where they're not going to be able just to fall back into that rut given the different coaches and voices and, and the basic thought processes they've brought in. So if this starts to go south, I don't think you can just, you know, devolve back into play action, turn your back to the defense and sling it. So this is also kind of interesting. This is from the 33rdteam.com. Those are former personnel guys, GMs. Highest paid quarterbacks in 2024. 
Uh, number one, Dak Prescott. They go 60 million projected extension. We'll see if that happens or not. Joe Burrow, 55 million. Justin Fields, 50. 2.5 million. Lamar Jackson, 52 million. Jalen Hurts, 51 million. Tua, 50 million. Again, projected extension. Jared Goff, 49 million. Projected extension. Kyler Murray, 46.1 million. Guess who's not on that list? And there's eight of them. That would be Deshaun Watson. Mm -hmm. And I, again, quarterback, wide receiver, edge rushers, with the salary cap going up. Those are just gonna. Those are those three positions are gonna balloon, and I really don't want to hear about the the guaranteed money. I, I get that it's that's what they needed to do to close the deal. That's anybody who's in been in negotiations. That's how Andrew Barry closed that deal. He guaranteed it. Yeah, those markets in particular reset themselves every off season, and we said it when they brought him in that that's you know fast forward three seasons and it's not going to be a big deal. You know, you're going to see the market just keep going up. And basically what it amounts to is now we're at the, the range that if Walton performs, all of a sudden that's a deal. But people don't want that. The national perception is they want that contract to be an albatross that prevents the Browns from doing other things. And it has just not been that. They've been able to maneuver around that contract. It, you can't point to one player that has stopped them from signing. They've been able to work with that, you know. So the fact that he's not on that list and we're just three years removed is is what we thought would happen. But I don't think that's what the national perception was. They thought that this was just going to be something that prevented the Browns from actually competing and, and doing the things they needed to to bring the players in. And it just hasn't amounted to that. Now, having said that, they knew, do need Deshaun Watson to, to perform to the level they thought he would or, or at least approach it because, they, because of the guaranteed contract, they can't really do anything with Deshaun Watson. They are with Deshaun Watson. There is no question about that. Yeah, but that's, you see what they've done to supplement the roster around him, even with that large guaranteed contract, they've been able to put the pieces in place that he doesn't have to be a world beater for this to be an excellent team. There's a world in which this team wins 12 games and we're still wanting to see more out of Watson. But that's a good spot to be in. You know, I think that's just where the level of the roster is now. And we obviously you want him to perform at the highest level possible because that's what's going to determine how far this team goes. But there are pieces are in place where he can start off slow and it's not going to be a detriment to your team. So um, starting quarterback and backup quarterback have been getting together. Out in L.A., Deshaun Watson uh, posts pictures of him. Jameis Winston uh, out in L.A. So um, the guys are getting ready. And, and again, um, you know, anything you can do to make Watson comfortable and get him to the level that he can perform to, you do it. That's what you do with a franchise quarterback. Yeah, and I'm just so happy with the signing of Jameis, you know, for a multitude of reasons. Uh, but to see him getting with Deshaun on, during the offseason and building that bond and building that rapport that they're going to need to have during a long season. You know, but I listened to Jameis just earlier today. He was on a podcast with Theo Vaughn, and he's just highly entertaining. He's just a fun dude to be around. He's positive. He has perspective. You know, I just think he's an excellent sounding board for Deshaun, and he's, got, he's a high-talented player. Like, I, I just I feel really comfortable with the situation that the Browns have cultivated in their quarterback room. All right. Uh, this from the Factory of Sadness uh, website. Three former Super Bowl champs the Browns could still sign. Uh, number one, they go Lawrence Guy, defensive tackle, age 34, isn't the player he once was, wreaking havoc for the Patriots, their Super Bowl win in 2018. But if he's healthy, uh, reliable, versatile, with ability to play multiple positions on the defensive line, Okay, I can see that. McCole Hardman taking another flyer, high upside receiver can be a, a worthy strategy. Hardman certainly fits that mold. Won his third Super Bowl, caught the game-winning touchdown pass. Um, I I think that would be redundant with uh, Jerry Judy and, and Elijah Moore. Uh, Cam Fleming, left tackle, 31-year-old, extensive playoff experience, having won two Super Bowls. Patriots earlier in his career missed 11 games last year, 12 games 2021. 20, Injuries clearly a concern. They got more tackles than they know what to do with already. They're still trying to find a way to get the, the Dewan Jones uh, on the field, so I, I don't see them bringing in another tackle. Just looking at that list, I mean, I would pass on all three, but if I was forced to take one, it may be Fleming. 
But I just see people forcing this need of defensive tackle. Like, I, I don't know. It might just be me. It might just be the way I see the room. But I just see what, what you the, – the step you were able to take last season, and then you substitute Elliott or Jefferson, which I think is a plus. And I, I just think that room's in a really good spot. And I could see maybe drafting one, but I don't think there's a need to go sign one through free agency. And I'm with you on Hardman. I think that that would it would just be an extra body for the sake of putting an extra body. In which I would also again, I would rather draft a guy to put in that role than someone who kind of duplicates skill sets that you already have. Casey Kinman from Dog Pound Daily and the Barking Browns podcast. Now I can step aside, take a quick time out. Other side of the break. Eight elite takes after the Browns wrap up March. That's from Sports Illustrated. Straight ahead on Sports for CLE. Stay with us. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program is dedicated to recognizing exceptional students, teachers, and schools throughout Ohio. Scan the QR code on screen to nominate students and teachers as academic all-stars and teachers of the month. They must be currently enrolled or teach in grades K through 12. Is your K through 12 school developing students' literacy skills to achieve success in reading? If so, you can nominate your school for the school of the year. Students can win $100, teachers can win $500, and schools can win $2,500. Scan the QR code, fill out the forms, and nominate deserving students, teachers, and schools today. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program takes pride in honoring exceptional students, teachers, and schools across Ohio. Submit your nomination today. It's fun, fast, and free. We continue talking Browns with Casey Kinnaman from Dog Pound Daily and the Barking Browns podcast. Eight elite takes after the Browns wrap up March just from Sports Illustrated. Number one, somehow Nick Chubb is going to play in 2024. Um, Casey, I, I would be stunned if Nick Chubb did not play in 2024. I don't think he's I – would, I would guess that he will start the season uh, physically unable to perform. But I'd be stunned if we don't see 24 in the backfield, some for the Browns. Which speaks to the character that Chubb is, because most people, when you'd see that knee injury and then find out it's the second devastating knee injury, you know, to that exact same knee, you would you would have pause. But it's Nick Chubb we're talking about. You know he's putting in the work. You know he's going to give it his all to get back on the field and get back to the top level he possibly can. And uh, I'm with you. If if Nick Chubb doesn't take a carry in 24, I I would I would lose my house. I'd, I'd bet everything on it. All right, Ken Dorsey and Kevin Stefanski are the perfect union of football philosophies. Um, I, I can't wait to see that. It, you know, I, I, I've said this a number of times. I, I talk to a lot of people at the Combine. Ken Dorsey is a pretty good offensive coordinator, and they described him as a good to borderline great quarterback coach, which I think is exactly what Deshaun Watson needs. Yeah, it's a massive need for the team. It's a massive need for Stefanski, so he didn't have to be hands-on in every approach. He can kind of, you know, corral everything together, but you have someone in Dorsey that you can trust to handle that room and to be the voice. And it's also a juxtaposition of attitudes because you could you even envision a world where Kevin Stefanski's freaking out, breaking his tablet, you know, over over the outcome of a game? No. But, you you know, you need that. You need yeah. that, that fire and ice type combination. And uh, Dorsey gives you that in juxtaposition to Stefanski. And, and it certainly worked with Jim Schwartz on the defensive side of the ball last year. So, um, all right, number three, Jerry Judy. Perfect addition um, to this offense for the Browns. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, the more you look at Judy in, in initial thing, I'm like, hey, he's kind of redundant to Elijah Moore. And, and that's not true. Yeah, I mean, I hope this is true. I hope, this is, I hope you look back and it's like, man, that's exactly what they needed. And you can envision it just from the skill set that it's what excites me more that what he gives you than what Moore is able to give you is he's a little bigger of a body, but he gives you more after the catch. He gives you more strength and physicality. He's slippery, and he has a speed that he can also break away. You know, And I just think that it – by putting him in this offense, you're going to allow Elijah Moore to get on the outside more where I think he can do more damage. So it kind of moves everything around to where I think you have uh, more stable depth at each position, and he gives you another playmaker on the field, which you can never have enough of those. All right, number four, they say build a dome. Um, and I've said this a number of times. Um, 
it's only eight to 10 events. You're, if you redo the stadium on the lakefront and it's a billion dollars, or you build one away from it, that lakefront property should be extremely valuable. Other Great Lake cities have built and, and made that a hub where you, mm -hmm. where you bring things that are more than eight or 10 dates. So Dome makes the most sense. Redevelop the lakefront and make it a destination that is a destination year round. Yeah, I'm team dome. I don't think there's any point in, you know, remodeling a stadium and not putting a dome on it. You're on a lake. It's in theory, it's just a, it's a, it was flawed from the beginning. You kind of, they kind of painted themselves in a corner. It's hard to get in and out of there. You know, the weather obviously is its own, uh, you know, additional thing. And, and you, there's no room for growth. You move the stadium to an area that's, it's easier to get to. It's easier to travel next to an airport. You build a dome, build the whole Brownstown around it, Hall of Fame, restaurants, hotels, the whole nine, have a good transportation system. And then you can build the lakefront up and connect it to your downtown for other things. All right. Uh, number five, I'll miss Joe Flacco, but it doesn't really matter. And we'll also do number six here, um, the AFC North is good <laughs> and it should say is really good um flacco you know what it was a great story um mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean you need a second you know it doesn't mean it needs a part two and the north is the best division in football and, and that's not going to change anytime soon yeah the, the flacco thing is going to be a moment in time we'll be able to look back on that fondly four or five years from now but it's just a moment in time. You know, I don't think that something you need to hold on to season after season thinking what would have happened if, you know. But the North, you said it, man. The division is not good. It is great. It is the best division in football. You know, you can win 12 games and still lose three in your division. That's how good this division is. You know, it's it's highly competitive top to bottom. And uh, it's it's – there's – at least three teams that are Super Bowl contenders in the same division. You know, you don't have that in any other division in football. And, you know, unfortunately, it's the division you play in. Uh, but you take your lumps, man. You know, we've been on the bottom of it for so long, it feels good to be in the competition side of it now, that, top, that upper end. Again, this is from Sports Illustrated. Um, number seven, I'm so excited to have first-round pick again in 2025. Um, okay. I, I would prefer it to be really late. I did not yeah, like yeah. I didn't like the top 10 top 15 picks in the first round. Um, I'd much rather be talking about home playoff games than the first round of the draft. Yeah, you want to be picking in that bottom third, you know, preferably 32. That's that's the spot you're all aiming for. But just going from three years of not having it, we're not going to know what to do with ourselves. <laughs> Getting to talk about all these upper elite prospects, we're we're digging through the weeds, you know. We're flipping over stones, looking looking for value. So to get in that first round again, that that'll be different for us. You know what? And, and Andrew Barry, uh, we've given him enough credit. He, he does a he's done a nice job. You got Emerson, you got Jones. Those are guys that you're going to look to extend when you need to. Um, that's third round pick and a fourth round pick that have been starters and will be. All right, uh, number eight, the final one of this. Hammer the Browns over. Eight and a half wins. That's the Vegas betting line. Uh, yeah, I think that's kind of low as well. Um, it, it is a tougher schedule without question, uh, but eight and a half seems low to me. That feels like their floor, doesn't it? Yeah. That doesn't feel like middle of the road. It could go either way. It feels like if everything went wrong, you only got eight wins, you know, which just think of where we've, came, where we've come from here. We've, you know, you go back to, you know, 17 and, you know, it's you had nothing, and and, and seven wins would feel like a, a triumph. You know, to the point where now where nine wins is disappointing. It's just it shows you how far we've came up in levels. But I agree, you hammer that over. That's I expect that to go up incrementally before we get to the beginning of the season. I won't be surprised if that's at ten by the uh, first game of the season. Yeah, as I said, you you, um, you went from a team that kind of struggled to now you're you're a perennial. Playoff team, you, you got to go from from that borderline to now. You got to host a game. You got to be the team that's always 
in the mix for the division so you get that home playoff game. That's the next step in the evolution um, uh, for, the, for the franchise. This is from Total Pro Sports, every team's best and worst moves of 2024 offseason. Best, signing Jameis Winston um, to be Watson's backup. Great decision for the Browns. They will need a viable option uh, for when Watson inevitably gets hurt or is forced out of action due to poor performance. Uh, that's, I don't know about the, the last line of that. Worst signing, Jordan Hicks. Not sure what the Browns were thinking with Hicks. He's talented, but he'll be 32 this summer, and he comes at a high cost. It was $4 million a year for two years, and I'll tell you what they were thinking. This guy's had 100 tackles the last five years. Um, I, I disagree. I, I think the Hicks signing was a really good signing. Yeah, stability. You have a, a stable running mate to put with JOK as he evolves, and he can play Mike or Sam. You know what I mean? He's versatile in both those roles. I think it was it, it, to act like it was a detrimental signing. That's a stretch, and it wasn't costly. You know, you got that. If you look at what Baker signed for Jerome Baker, you got a steal. So I think you're very happy with getting Hicks for the number that you got Hicks. And I love the Jameis signing. As I said earlier, I just think the narrative around that reason is crazy to me. You know, everybody's clouded by what happened last season with Deshaun's injuries, but to act like he's been injury riddled throughout his career and it's inevitable that he's going to miss games is a farce. Yeah. And just just put keep this in mind. He tried, he wanted to play through the shoulder injury. <laughs> right. He wanted to be on there. And they had to tell him they had to stop, they had to, you know, help him from hurting himself. You know, so that's what took him back. But yeah, I don't see it that way. And I, I don't see inevitability of, of him getting benched for poor play. I think those are false narratives. Uh, Although I'm very happy with signing of Jameis Winston. Casey Kinneman from Dog Pound Daily and uh, the Barking Browns podcast. Now I'm going to step aside, take one more time out. Other side of the break, we'll head to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Viewers want to talk a little bit about the draft. That's straight ahead on Sports for CLE. We'll be back. Holy Buckeye. You are looking live at the new number one sports card show in Cleveland. Don't miss the Great Lakes Collectors Convention presented by Gritty Sports Cards, where the passions of sports fans and collectors collide April 5th through the 7th at the Independence Fieldhouse. Hundreds of tables of ball card bliss, card show live theater, celebrity appearances, kid-friendly games, ComC Consignment Center, and so much more. Great cards, great location, great show. For more information, visit GreenySportsCards.com. We continue talking Browns with Casey Kinneman from Dog Pound Daily and the Barking Browns podcast. Uh, let's head to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Hey guys, Dan in Maryland here. You know, like a lot of people right now, I'm playing junior GM and you know looking at possible draft picks for the Browns. And one guy I'm liking more and more is Ben Sinat, tight end, fullback, H back, hybrid versatile player out of Kansas State. To me, the fact that he's able to line up in a variety of positions it suggests to me he's got the versatility that you really want at TE2. Various quote-unquote draft experts have him going anywhere from the second round to the fifth round. I don't see him lasting all the way to the fifth round. I think he's probably going to go in the third round uh, at the latest. If he's there at 85, I'd love to see the Browns draft him. My concern is, is that he won't be there at 85. I'm not sure if he's somebody worth taking at 54, but again, I think Ben Sinus is somebody who I think would be a just a fantastic fit for this team. I'm just interested in what you guys think of him and, and what you think would be a uh, an appropriate level draft pick for him. Anyhow, keep up the good work. Go Browns. As always, appreciate all the voicemails. So, Casey, take a look at this. This is from PFF. Uh, highest graded red zone receivers over the past two seasons. Uh, number one is um, the caller's Ben Steinott. Tight end, 87.7 grade, uh, Kansas State's most targeted receiver in the red zone. 12 of his 16 catches resulted in first downs. Uh, number three on that list is Roman Wilson, 85.6 grade, tied with Marvin Harrison Jr. Wilson was Michigan's favorite red zone target over the past two seasons, 34.4 threat rate. Keep in mind, they don't throw the ball much, um, Michigan either. And then Malachi Corley was uh, the sixth uh, red zone target, 79.5. Led all draft eligible, group of five players, red zone catches. Uh, 13 of his 15 targets, five touchdowns, eight first downs, uh, 100 yards after the catch, which was first. Um, I, I, I like the, the thought, if he's there, I, I don't think I'd take him in the second round. Third or fourth round? Yeah, I, I think that's, I, I like that thought. 
Yeah, I think he would sort of come on your radar at pick 85. Um, I, I love his skill set. He's more of a complete tight end that he's getting credit for. He can do the H-back stuff. He can do the move Y flex stuff. But he can also be that inline guy if he needs to be. Uh, he's someone I, I, if you just think of what they were able to do with Harrison Bryant, I think an up, Ben Sinat would be an upgrade from that. Uh, but I don't know if 80, you know, I just think that pick's so valuable. If you look at what's going to be on the board at 85, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of stuff there. Uh, I lump him in with Jaheim Bell of tight ends that I like and, and that range. The problem with the Browns is you go from that pick 85 and you don't pick again to the fifth round. So unless they were able to accumulate an extra pick, because I think that he'd be a prime candidate for like beginning of a uh, day three guy. Uh, so I, I look at him in that range. I think he's on your radar at 85. I just don't know if they go that direction. Fair enough. All right. NFL draft needs and best prospect fits. This from ESPN.com. For the Browns, top three needs, they say wide receiver, running back, defensive tackle. Prospect to fill a need outside of round one. They go with Jalen Wright, running back from Tennessee. Wright has speed around the corner and excellent vision in space. Posted uh, over 1,000 yards on the ground, four touchdowns in 2023. Your thoughts on Wright? It seems sacrilegious when I say this, but I only say it because I mean it. When I watch Wright, I see some of the traits you see in Nick Chubb. You know, we always talk about Nick Chubb and it's his power and his speed. But, like, the thing that we don't talk about near enough is how patient he is and how excellent his vision is. He's able to press the hole. He sees the backside lane the split second before it opens. And as soon as it does, he has the explosivity to, you know, bang right through there and get to the open field. Wright has some of that. His, his vision isn't on Chubb's level but I consider Chubb's vision to be top tier of the NFL. But Wright has that vision, and he has more than enough speed to get through there and get to the open field. And if he's even, he's leaving. No one's catching this dude from behind. <clears throat> and if I'm looking at the running backs that are available, he's my number three back. And, and I just think that he has tremendous upside, and he's a true home run hitter. I don't necessarily see them taking a running back at 54. Do you? No. No, they've insulated themselves just the way they went about their offseason. Now, they're prepared for life without Nick Chubb in the short term, but not the long term. So I don't think that you're really going to be looking at running back. And the running back range is going to be about round three, round three to four. I think you're going to see a lot of quality guys go in there, but there's not going to be many guys left after round four. So it's that sweet spot. So I think 85 is a prime spot for uh, running back if they go that direction. Who are some of the ones that you think, that, that you that you like that might be there in that fourth round range. Well, you look at uh, Marshawn Lloyd out at USC. He's more of a receiving back. He gives you some of the inside the tackle stuff, but he's really dynamic in the passing game. Right, obviously, he's one. Audric Estime is another out of Notre Dame. Um, it'll be interesting to see where Trey Benson goes. I think he's the most complete back in this draft. And he's ready to go right now, although he doesn't have the ceiling that some of these other backs do. But I think he has the highest floor. But I think that range right there is where you're going to see a lot of backs come into play. Braylon Allen out of Wisconsin's another one. And I think that's the range you're going to see of quality guys who do have starting potential eventually. Yeah, I, I'm, I like Estime and I like Allen as well. Estime, I know he didn't run real well at the Combine. I saw enough Notre Dame games mm -hmm. where he's running away from – He's just running away from guys that are chasing him. That's fast enough in football terms. Well, that's just it, too, that that running time, it, it might actually help him. For so a team like the Browns who aren't trying to, to, to go high and get a running back, he might fall into their lap because they're not going to really pay attention to those numbers. They have GPS tracking numbers from end game, you know, and those numbers, those, those are play numbers. Those are what they, they, the athlete's capable of on the field, and those numbers mean way more than what they run in a 40-yard dash. All right, uh, before I let you go, this is a, um, a recent mock draft, Josh Edwards from CBSSports.com. Um, at 54, he has the Browns taking a wide receiver, Malachi Corley from Western Kentucky. At 85, an offensive tackle from Yale, Karan Omegaji. Um, Corley, again, if, if Corley is there um, at 54, I think you and I have talked about this. That's a skill set. I don't see a receiver like that on the Browns, and I could see where you might want that. Oh, yeah. I, I'd be more than happy with Corley if that's what fell in your lap at 54. It gives you a differentiating skill set. Someone who's absolutely punishing with the ball in his hands. And the outside linebackers aren't, aren't free from it either. He'll, he'll take on all challengers. Uh, he won't have like a high average depth of target. 
but he'll he'll provide you easy receptions and give you real serious work after the catch. And it's something you currently don't have in your wide receiver room. And Joku kind of gives you the same element mm-hmm. in the passing game. So you, now you'd have another punishing guy. What kills me, though, is in that same draft, they had Xavier Leggett going 51. That'll break my heart if he goes to the Steelers. That is, <laughs> that is a guy that I'm holding out that he just, I, I'm hoping he slides. All right, the tackle from Yale. Um, do you like him? They, they need to get some young offensive linemen, probably more so interior, um, just because you do have Dewan Jones. Yeah, and we will – Joel Batonio has got to be getting near the end of it. You start to, you need to have a contingency plan. Uh, but I like Amagaji a, a great deal. And I think, you know, this is a very, very deep offensive tackle draft. I'm not going to be surprised if seven tackles go in round one, which would be a record, you know. But that pushes really good players down the board. And if someone like Amagaji, he has the, the frame, the movement skills, the size, the power. He has everything that you look for in a prospect. And normally that guy would go in round two, and he might be available in round three. So I think... That would be a steal if he fell in your lap. Casey Kinnaman, as always, great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Casey. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Casey Kinnaman, make sure you check him out. Dog Pound Daily. He is also co-host of the Barking Browns podcast. It's going to do it for this edition of Sports for CLA. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Have a great night, everybody. See you tomorrow at 4 on Sports for CLA.